Welcome to WordPath, the show about Oklahoma Indian languages and the people who are teaching and preserving them. Tonight, my guest is James Bird, who is Cherokee. Welcome, James. Thanks for being on WordPath. It's nice to have you with us. Well, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Uh, to start us off, could you just tell us a little bit about yourself? I understand you're Cherokee, but you're not Oklahoma Cherokee. Maybe you could explain your background. Well, actually, I was born in Georgia, but uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Eastern Band of Cherokees in Cherokee, North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And for people that may not know much about Cherokees at all, there are basically two communities of Cherokees in the United States, right? Well, Maybe there are people. there are three recognized bands: the oh, Katua, really? uh -huh. the Cherokee Nation of Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and the Eastern Band of Cherokees. And the, East, the Eastern Band of Cherokees are the largest single group in the East. Okay. Um, did you grow up speaking Cherokee as a child? Well. I, uh, I grew up uh, initially with a, in a bilingual household. Mm -hmm. so my father was uh, uh, a f native speaker, and uh, so my mother wasn't. She was, mm -hmm. so she's a Georgia Irish, mm -hmm. and uh, so my I had so the first few years of my life so I had this uh, language influence from my father. That's great. You were very lucky. Yeah. But see, when he died in an accident, mm -hmm. and I, when I was at an early age, my brother was still an infant, mm -hmm. and mother uh, wound up moving to uh, out of state to Newark, New Jersey. In fact, take a job mm -hmm. in a factory mm -hmm. at Westinghouse, mm -hmm. and so I grew up in an urban environment speaking English. Mm -hmm. And uh, although we spent some summers as children on the reservation with my family. Uh, and exposed and around mm -hmm. language there. So you had other uh, family still primarily members? grew up speaking English. You had other family members who spoke Cherokee too, though? Oh, sure, yeah. Uh -huh. mm, the, yeah. It's oh. changed though, over the se last several years. You know, I've mm -hmm. seen it, my experience over the generations. So I'm 46 now, and if, when we look at uh, kin groups, generationally, you see another generation. They tear up approximately around every 10 years. And there's the importance and the use of language among the generations seems to be sliding off, mm. decreasing. We hear that all too often. Yeah. I'll, I'll ask you a little bit more about the language community in a minute. Let me ask you a little bit more about yourself first. You find yourself in Norman, Oklahoma because of your studies, right? As a I'm graduate gra student at yeah. OU? That's right. I'm a graduate student in anthropology. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, um, I got my undergraduate degree at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro, Georgia. Mm -hmm. I was uh, originally an electrical engineering student. Cause <laughs> no I had, I was, in my, one of my prior lives, I was an oh. electronics technician. Oh. And uh, I got laid off in 89, and I was unemployed for two years, and I went back to school uh, to, in order to, uh, to further my professional uh, ambitions. Right. And I took a uh, course, a free elective, which, out of just general interest, mm -hmm. which was uh, Indians of the Southeast mm -hmm. North America. And uh, during that course, I read uh, our course textbook was Hudson Southeast Indians, and uh, it raised it raised an awareness in me about mm -hmm. uh, Indian identity and Indianness. And he specifically addressed uh, three points of view mm -hmm. re re uh, re respecting. Indian identity, and that is blood quantum, uh, and uh, what he called cultural sense, cultural identity, mm -hmm. with language, you know, religion and beliefs, and what he called a social sense, as mm -hmm. uh, as the interaction of Indians among Indians, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the basis for my master's mm -hmm. thesis now, Very which I'm in the process of writing. Very interesting. Do you have a title yet? This is social identity, uh, kinship, and social identity among the Eastern Band of Cherokee. Very interesting. Well, now, um, a friend of mine, Little Bird, told me <laughs> that since your time in Oklahoma, you've been spending summers back in North Carolina doing uh, field well, work or gathering language I've been materials. spending so summers sure in North Carolina all my life. Exactly what. Well, tell us what you do <laughs> but, when you go yeah, there. Yeah, the so perspective on the, my activities the there, language. perspective of my activities there in the summers changed since I was a child. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah. Particularly uh, with my interest in anthropology. Mm -hmm. Uh, and culture. Uh, d d in, uh, although I found that uh, it, whenever we 
uh, meet you know, new people, or we have this social behavior, and we ask and to identify each other and mm -hmm. relate our uh, so, social status and all these other things. Mm -hmm. We ask ourselves, well, who are you, where are you from, and who are your kinfolk? Mm -hmm. And uh, this last question, kinfolk, always seems to come up uh, in closed-knit groups, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to f explore this further. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from this anthropological perspective. Mm -hmm. And so, um, in the summer of 96, I was doing research. Well, every summer I'm doing research. But this particular summer, I had an opportunity to work with a, a group who were doing some language preservation work. And it, it's uh, Robert Bushyhead mm -hmm. and uh, his daughter, Jean Blanton, and another uh, anthropologist, uh, Bo Taylor, mm -hmm. who's a distant cousin. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, uh, they were working, they had, she had a grant, and they were recording sp speech patterns from her dad, who was, at the time was 84 years old, Robert Bushyhead, mm -hmm. uh, the, what he called the Katua dialect. And this was mm -hmm. the dialect supposedly spoken among the middle towns groups, mm -hmm. and is supposed to be the native dialect of the Eastern Band. Mm -hmm. hmm. Very interesting. So yeah. when you've been on a research trip like this, Besides your own personal experiences and memories, what do you bring back? I'm curious. Oh, the, my notes and so stuff you have like notes, that. Tape, well, the pictures. difference in the dialect, you know, it's uh, mm. well among uh, native speakers. The, perhaps you know, because there's a fine line here between in the perspectives between objective and subjective. As mm. being uh, a member of the band and been around the language, you know, I think my perspective anthropologist would say was subjective, or, or mm. because I'm, I'm part of the group, mm. but. Because my personal history was, uh, is primarily English speaking, mm -hmm. this was all new stuff for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, with, with training in anthropology, linguistic anthropology, I could, uh, I could, I could uh, analyze the words and mm -hmm. speech patterns um, and perform mechanically, you know, mm -hmm. the phonetics, uh, morphology, and uh, doing morpheme uh, analysis, they can mm. see the difference in the dialect. The native speakers don't, don't believe it. You know, I mean, many times, I mean, mm. there are educated people like Durban Feeling and other native speakers who are aware of the dialectic differences, mm. but people who grew up speaking it don't, don't uh, really aren't aware mm. of it or uh, don't admit it. Say, well, they just say, well, he's a good speaker or he's uh -huh. not a good speaker. Or, you're in such an interesting position, it sounds like, because in a way you're part of the group and in a way you're not. As far as your ability to observe and analyze, you can be an objective outsider, I think, a lot. And yet, because you are Cherokee and came from that community, you must, well, how should I put it? You must care a lot more about what it is that you're researching. Well, oh, have yeah. a different kind of caring yeah. about the so-called data than, than your average uh, researcher who's just yeah. Uh, yeah, certainly. not of that group. Th there's that, uh, the personal desire to relearn yeah. Or reclaim your heritage, and yeah. it adds self-esteem. And uh, yeah. what was one of those things? Oh, reaffirm my identity. Certainly, yeah. it must be very powerful. Well, it's absolutely. They have that kind of personal connection to your work. Yeah, it it does. It you know, if it's from a cultural perspective, it, it adds more to you. I mean, you get uh, emotional, um, sure. uh, and it it just adds this uh, cultural perspective that. You, that uh, many an emotional perspective that as uh, when we try to be objective and use a scientific method, we divorce our mm -hmm. anthropologists, try to divorce themselves in order mm -hmm. to obtain this objective perspective. But I think it's a, a key and, and it's important because it adds, um, it adds emphasis to ambition and desire to mm -hmm. follow through. Mm -hmm. And when, mm -hmm. when you get, when, many times in our research, uh, I get tired, or bored, or mm -hmm. fatigued, you know, and sure. it's, uh, it's, that, it's that little something extra that drives, keeps driving me. I'll bet, yeah. The scientific side of it says uh, you don't want to care too much because you have to remain objective and you uh. don't want to be biased. On the other hand, there's a difference between being biased and just being passionate about your work. Well, the passion is what is drives. It's extremely important. I mean, yeah. we should all be so lucky, you know. I feel like uh, the work that I do is exactly what I love and care about mm. the most, but I think for an awful lot of people it's not the case, so it's really a good position to be in. 
Uh, well, about the anthropology, uh, yeah. we had a speaker last last year who came on campus, Ward Goodenough, and he, uh, in his opening statement to his lecture, he brought up a very important point that I thought, that I feel uh, I relate to very much. It's uh, that in anthropology, we could find any, any, uh, any facet of, of society that interests us, and we can research it and uh, discover underlying uh, facts or about it, how, what makes it work. What the, so these are things that make society work. Mm -hmm. you know, the social interaction between people, mm -hmm. what, the key things that motivate us to do what we do and be right. what we are. Right. Um, let me ask you a little bit, since you kind of uh, I know something about the North Carolina community and the Oklahoma communities, and uh, you've studied the Cherokee language at OU also, haven't you? Yes. Um, can you give us some kind of an overview of language efforts or what you see as kind of the, the situation with Cherokee uh, today in, in the United States, let's say, in, including both communities? Uh, well, there are efforts in both uh, here in Oklahoma and in Cherokee, North Carolina to preserve and create uh, I guess you could say libraries, dictionaries mm -hmm. of the language. Excuse me, I had to rub my nose. <laughs> it's okay, that's allowed mm -hmm. on the show. <laughs> uh, so it, you're talking about it's a lot like, of uh, documentation it's, of the language. Mm, uh -huh. Yeah, it, uh, it's important because we realize uh, the, the, the value that it adds to our claim to Indian heritage and our Indian identity. and. It's important because the the number of native speakers seems to be decreasing. Um, there was there's stigma attached to uh, in eastern, uh, particularly among the eastern Cherokees, for many years, uh, due to repression of the culture and the language use of uh, mean, speaking in public. Do you mean stigma Sp within the community or just from the within Cherokees? the community? Really? Yeah, and even and even outside the boundaries of the Kuala Reservation, mm -hmm. uh, the Cherokees. Speakers don't normally address each other in public in English. I mean, in Cherokee, they dress mm -hmm. in English, speak English. Um, it and it's it's that. under it's under very informal circumstances at the house mm -hmm. between family members that they uh, speak native language, speak Cherokee. Mm -hmm. uh, Do you find that to be a similar attitude here in Oklahoma, or is there a difference in the two in that way? Um, well, you know, when I talk to a fellow, some people from here from Oklahoma say that the same situation exists. Yeah. Um, they feel uncomfortable uh, speaking, talking Indian uh, around people who aren't, have, are not part of the group, hmm. the language group. What do you think about that? It makes me feel a little sad to hear you say that. Well, I haven't been able to, I'm not fluent, you know, I've been, I've been trying, to, I've been working on uh, improving my fluency, but uh, when my, when my kinfolk and family, friends, uh, Go on, t go. You know, I do this code. What we call code switch from English mm -hmm. to Cherokee. Uh, I can't keep up with them. I catch key words here and there, so I have some idea of what's going on in the conversation. But I, and I do feel a little uncomfortable because you know I have. I wish I could understand everything you were saying. Hmm. So I, I share that feeling as well as you do. Yeah. I'm sure. But what about those, um, those people, like? Say, so I'm thinking of like two of your relatives who are both fully fluent uh, in a home setting. They might speak to each other very comfortably just in Cherokee, have no problem with that. And then might, they might be in the store and one think of something to say to the other and they'll feel inhibited about saying it in Cherokee. Is that, that was really the issue I was thinking about. To oh, me, that mm -hmm. sounds sort of sad. It almost, it almost sounds like a lack of self-esteem. I'm not trying to put that on your family with mm -hmm. my hypothetical example here, but yeah. I wonder when people, I mean, the word ashamed almost comes to mind. Is there a kind of shame, or is it more just a, a what is behind well, that, not wanting some, to use it I in think public that, in an uh, English-speaking environment? Uh, my, uh, my friends and family tell me that things, some things are easier to express and say in mm -hmm. English for them than it is in Indian. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a lot of words that uh, had to be Indianized or borrowed from English, you know, and mm -hmm. turned into Indian that, uh, that, that didn't exist you know, this century, before this century. Sure, I mean, yeah. the so language, that, mm -hmm. I think, yeah. if, as long as the language is alive, it continues to change and adapt mm 
Right. It's when the language dies that it becomes locked in, right. type and print, or on tape or CD or video or, or whatever, so that uh, the, these, these, uh, this change in the language, the words get adopted in, Mm. And the language grows and mm. changes and is active. But well, the, the, the stigma that yeah. people feel that That's my, there's native speakers at. among each if other there's a stigma, in public. Why, why is that? And is there something we could do or I, someone could do to lessen that? I think, I think that they're being possessive. I don't think that people oh. are ashamed. Okay. I think That's many good. times oh. that uh, they feel that it's an expression of Indianness between Indians oh, and that uh, to use it in public among non-speakers mm -hmm. somehow mm -hmm. is, uh, doesn't honor the language or something like that. Oh, I see. I mean, that's so one it's perspective. not really a negative thing, as you see. Not necessarily. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I did, did a recent show where I was talking about comparing uh, endangered languages to endangered species, and I said <laughs> a language has to have a habitat, too, you know? Oh, it has, uh, the habitat of a, of a language is the different parts of life where the language is used, and there have to be enough of those settings where the language is used for the thing mm -hmm. to be uh, maintained, you know, maintainable. Yeah. Um, do you feel like there, if people are going to hold back from using it in certain environments, are there enough environments, say in North Carolina, the, f the situation you're probably more familiar with, is there enough habitat for the language to keep going? You said it's, you said well, it indicated it had started have, to slip make, away, but can, do you mm -hmm. think it can be um, well, they're making, uh, they're, the administration in Cherokee, the chief's office and the education administration are making efforts to uh, keep the language alive. Good. There's mandatory uh, edu uh, language education f all from elementary through mm -hmm. high school. And, um, and then it, there are like this other language preservation program I talked about that could do a dialect. Mm -hmm. and, the, the, and there are other plans in the future to continue this preservation work. But the usage, uh, I found, is among certain specific kin groups and that uh, originally were fairly well geographically isolated. And there, hmm. the community, the Cherokee Eastern Band is composed of six communities. There's hmm. Snowbird and Big Cove hmm. and Wolftown and Paint Town, Soko. Some of the, some of the, and Yellow Hill, was some of these, three of these, the Soko, Yellow Hill, and uh, uh, Paint Town are in, the, in the, uh, the immediate tourist area, and there's a lot of interaction there in English. Mm -hmm. But in the outer, further out group, uh, Big Cove and Snowbird and Wolf Town is more geographically isolated from this, mm -hmm. from the, the Cherokee mm -hmm. proper, the t Cherokee town, where so all the trading posts and yeah. all the tourists are. So um, the kin groups that lo live out there. I interact in in the native language. Um, mm. They find that the children, though, when they come home, are speaking a lot of English. Because a lot of watching a lot of TV and a lot, mm -hmm. and that's all sure. in English. Yeah. And I, uh, a friend of mine made a suggestion to, to, to try. I don't know how much they follow through on this. That they should uh, be putting all the all the signs in public. Mm -hmm. public places should be in syllabary, Cherokee, so that we I can like read. I like ideas like that myself. Yeah, and they should be broadcasting but All by themselves, they don't make someone fluent, but they help <laughs> to maintain that sense that this is a Cherokee-speaking place. Absolutely. You know, I like that. Yeah, and they should have, uh, should have native language uh, on, the, uh, on the, the tribal television channel, on the cable TV sure, there. Sure, that would be great. Yeah. That would be great. Um, let me ask you another thing. Be because of your situation as a student of Cherokee here and then going back as a Cherokee person to North Carolina, do you feel like there are certain things that you can learn when you go back to North Carolina that you can't learn, uh, there must be, that you can't learn by studying Cherokee at the university? Or are there things you can learn at the university mm -hmm. that you can't necessarily learn by going back there? Well, yeah, it all goes back to uh, what the, the way that we have the Cherokee program here, uh, we have a native speaker and we have a co-instructor mm -hmm. uh, who's, who's trained in linguistic anthropology. And uh, there's, there's, we can, uh, they use an approach that, uh, that with, in combination with uh, doing morphology and anthrop mm -hmm. linguistic anthropology and hearing uh, the native speaker mm -hmm. speak it in conversational mm -hmm. tone. 
So you, you hear the difference here. The written Cherokee and spoken Cherokee are different just as English is different. When we write things down, we do it in a very formal manner. Right. But when we speak, we use contractions right. and sure. we use uh, colloquialisms. And the same thing is true in Cherokee. Mm -hmm. Truncate final vowels mm -hmm. and uh, kind of run words together. Sure. So yeah. this, the same uh, processes in speaking occur yeah. in, in all languages like that way. Yeah. How much is um, reading and writing used back in Cherokee, North Carolina? Or is it more of an oral well, maintenance we have of the language? The Cherokee One Feathers are, uh, are besides being the, the tribe's legal vehicle, uh, also you know as a billboard for the community mm -hmm. and uh, in, uh, notices from the, what's going on among the tribe, the chief, the council. Mm -hmm. uh, has uh, does things with language, a little syllabary. Do they? Uh, not as I don't think this as comprehensive, perhaps as the advocate. Are you familiar with that? Uh, I've heard of it, but I'm not familiar enough with okay, the whole. That's, that's Cherokee uh, seem to really appreciate it, probably. Yeah, we'll uh, give him a plug. The huh? <laughs> is somewhat, uh, it's a bilingual publication, isn't it? Not in Cherokee. It's primarily English, okay. in North Carolina. Mm. Okay. So, hmm, what am I trying to get at here? Do people uh, read books or newspapers or that sort of thing oh, in the Cherokee mm -hmm. language? Well, they, uh, a lot of the elders who attend church have their Bibles in syllabary. Mm. Oh, that's a good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hymnals, we, perhaps, or yeah, and uh -huh. yeah, we sing songs at church in Cherokee. Yeah. And, you know. Yeah. Uh, read scripture, and uh, have Cherokee uh, used in ceremonies, weddings, and uh, mm -hmm. funerals. Sure. Yeah. So, now, there's a public setting for that. We we only have a few minutes left, and I would. Be remiss, I think, if I didn't ask you this question, because we might have a lot of people listening who are oh. students of Cherokee here in Oklahoma. Can you maybe cite a few differences between? I gather there is a sort oh, of dialect mm. difference between the Eastern dialect and uh, and Oklahoma well, Cherokee. Are mm -hmm. there some specific words that are different, or what are the main differences between? Well, if the we two? look in the, 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 the our uh, syllabary chart, you'll see three three variants there in each uh, mm -hmm. each form of the syllabary. For as well, not all of the, not all of them, but most many of them, uh, Z, G, and Chi, mm -hmm. Zo, Jo, Cho, uh, G, mm -hmm. uh, Ja, Za, mm -hmm. Cha. So although they sound very the slight in difference when mm -hmm. written, they use the same character in syllabary, but they sound different. Mm -hmm. And f for uh, s for a student uh, to recognize it in conversation is the key because it, it right. runs fast, so fast, right. it's hard. A little really change hard. can really kill yeah. you sometimes. And, uh, yeah. well, I tried using my, my reacquired skills in uh -huh. Cherokee, North Carolina. And how does that work? And I, was, well, I was told you sound a lot like a white man who's <laughs> speaking Indian. <laughs> but maybe, I wonder if well, some of it relate. is that they're hearing you speak a different it's dialect. Valid. It's valid. Some well, the it. dialect is different, yeah. Well, oh. in Cherokee, North Carolina, we don't say wado, we say ski. Oh, this is a completely different word for thank yeah, you. Yeah, for thank you. Now, I'm hmm. uh, I, I believe that uh, well, Durbin said that ski just means, uh, isn't it so? Hmm. That's, that's it. But it functions as a thank that's you. That's it. It functions the same. So mm. it means thank you. I've, but <laughs> I find the wado is used among uh, Muscogee speakers here as well. Oh, I think really? Seminoles and Creeks hmm. use it. Uh, Another is do used. We say do used instead of gado used, which means what is it? Mm. We say do used. Mm. And but we, we use the za instead of ja in the oh. dialect. So it sounds like and mostly some certain consonants are a little different. A few words are completely different. Mm. But by well, and large, I can. If I had a chart, I could show you. Well, <laughs> but by and large, if a fluent speaker from Oklahoma was speaking to a fluent speaker from North Carolina, mm. would they understand most of what uh, each other I made this, I ran this experiment. You did? And what yeah, happened? I had, well, I called up a friend of mine here, the, our native speaker, Bobby Blossom, mm -hmm. and I put him on the phone with my aunt, Lucinda. And uh, all, you could see that she was making just in her face and you know, thinking and concentrating. And after a few minutes, the, the, she said, well, he's a good speaker. And they, she you know, but I, uh -huh. but I, I, re, I, could, I can recognize the dialect difference between the two. Oh, personally, myself. Very interesting. Very interesting. Well, you're about to graduate here from with your MA, right? Uh, I'm just curious uh, with all this uh, 
Pfeiffer. Passion for this kind of work and all of your training and in, in language and culture and uh, the kinship section, uh, part of your work, which we didn't really have time to get into. Um, what kind of work are you looking for when you get out of school? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hoping that uh, they'll have some. I can get go to work for the tribe. Um, I hope that uh, we'll be I'll be doing something with language preservation. That would be excellent. Uh, that would be ideal. Uh, another th another thing is that. I've been trying to press for the, the tribe the project is tribal historic preservation, Good. whereby Good. the tribe would assume the state historic preservation office duties and uh, the, the, all the work that's associated culturally with that office. Mm, excellent. Now, I ran into you at OU at the Stomp Dance uh, recently, <laughs> and I met your wife, Pamela, right? Yes. And you have a baby. Let me uh, close by asking you, uh, what languages is that baby going to speak? <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> well, you know, we have this uh, profuse amount of English in our culture, and but every we have this toy, this little talking thing. You push the button, play music, it gives mm -hmm. a word. Bird, squeak, you know, cheep, cheep, cheep. And I, I repeat the uh, Cherokee for the words for her, so Good. I try to raise her bilingual, and we move Good. back to Cherokee after I graduate. Well, she'll grow up she'll actually grow around up the family. Line. And That'll kin members excellent. speaking Cherokee. And, and then uh, uh, hopefully school. she'll be lucky like you and grow up in a bilingual environment. Wow. I think that's a priceless <laughs> experience. I think it's wonderful. <laughs> well, I think, are we out of time? We've got to wrap it up. I'm sorry. Okay. It's been just delightful yeah, talking to, to you. Talk I'm, about. I'm sorry it went by so quickly, but thank you very much for joining okay, us. Okay, he's glad to be here. You. And uh, join us next time on WordPath. Now, hey, there, yo, hey, there. Na hey ne yo hey ne, ana ma go na kita wa pe ne ma da o ne kita. Na hey ne yo hey ne, na hey ne yo hey ne, ana ma go na kita wa pe ne ma da o ne kita. Na hey ne yo hey ne, na hey ne yo hey ne, ana ma go na kita wa pe ne ma da o ne kita. Na hey ne yo hey ne, na hey ne yo hey ne, ana ma gwa na kita, wa pe ne ma na o ne kita.